I'm Wendy Vance. Um, I'm the regular ed English teacher at Hornet Central High School. And I'm Jesse Gadden. I'm the special education teacher at Hornet Central High School. And this is my third year teaching and my first year co-teaching. I've been teaching 12 years, um, some in Cumberland County and then some in Harnett County. Um, we'd like to talk to you guys about co-teaching and what works and what doesn't work. And we have a short video for you guys uh, to see a demonstration um, of an activity we did with our children. Um, we co-teach in 10th grade. Um, the next semester we'll be teaching two 9th grade English classes together. Um, so co-teaching um, is defined as two teachers. You have an EC and a general education teacher. They work together, student sharing. We plan, organize, deliver instruction together. Um, both teachers are actively involved, so we will sit down together and work out a lesson and decide, you know, what do we think is going to work with this group of kids, um, where are they going to have any trouble at, and try to hit those spots before we deliver the lesson. And at the forefront of all of our co-teaching decisions is the idea that in a co-teaching classroom, it's indiscernible who is the regular education teacher and who's the special education teacher. And I think that definition helped us a lot when it came to like, okay, how are we gonna do this? How are we gonna introduce ourselves to our kids? And um, to this day, unless one of my EC kids has worked with me personally, I don't think any of our students can really tell um, who does what. And they can't because they'll turn in things to her, they'll turn them in to me, she'll grade, I'll grade. Um, and we talked about this when we first started and were assigned to each other and our principal at the time, Cindy Gordon, uh, was the one that put us together. And so we give her a lot of credit for, you know, being able to match up personalities. Um, and we said, how do we go into this and try to figure out to keep the kids from figuring, you know, oh, she's the regular teacher, she's our special education teacher. You know, we didn't want them to come to just me for everything. We wanted them to come to her equally. So what I decided was is because most of them knew, you know, Ms. Bowden from Palau or curriculum assistance, and they knew that I had always did, you know, regular ed, I said, I want you to take the lead. So when we first started the school year, um, she was the first to introduce herself and talk to the class. And I kind of stepped back and took a little bit of a back seat. And then we just kind of like worked off of each other and just kind of chimed in back and forth. And that really helped to establish um, that she had just as much power in the classroom as I did. So we thought that was a very important thing is how can we overcome you know, this situation here. Um, is there anything you want to add to that? Oh yeah, and I mean, we're probably gonna develop this more as our presentation goes on, but co-teaching is so much about like cooperation. So not only are we having to convince our students that we, you know, there isn't a reg ed versus special ed teacher, we're also having to merge our own teaching styles. This lady knows everything there is to know about English and she's as sharp as a tack. I'm the touchy-feely teacher that's like, oh, it's okay, take a break, do you want a hug, let's talk about it. <laughs> um, and so those are two very different styles and having to make sure that every decision we make is for the benefit of our kids, both emotionally and intellectually, has been a challenge, but I also think it's made our teaching way more effective. And I mean, there's a big age difference too. So she's in her 20s, I'll be 50 this year, so, you know, um, so we come from, you know, different generations and, but at no time did we think, you know, that that was going to be cumbersome to us. Um, we tended to mesh together really good. Um, she really helps to balance me out. I tend to be a little more old school, a little more stricter, um, and she's kind of, you know, a little more laid back. So she's really taught me a lot how to just kind of relax a little bit and kind of take a step back. And you've taught me too, because <laughs> she will, I am really organized, but I'm also have a lazy streak that I can't get rid of. And so she'll be like, did you grade those papers? Or is it okay? Are you gonna get this done? Texting me on Sunday, like, is this done? And I need that. Um, and so really like it's the ideal classroom setting because we have that laid back, Stern, right. like marriage. 
And, you know, there's a lot of times that I'll say, oh, I've got all this grading to do. I have to get all of this done. And she'll say, well, give me some of that. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Here, take it, you know. <laughs> Can I move ahead to the next one? Yeah. All right. So we talked a little bit about this, um, co-teaching strategies to use, um, assessing student learning. That's, she's such a big help because a lot of students, you can read an IEP, but there's nothing, you know, that you like better than to have someone tell you personally that's worked with that student. Um, and they can relay, you know, problems or situations that they may have had in the past, ways they overcame them, and ways that maybe they haven't been able to overcome them. And, you know, was it something that, you know, had to do with, like, the teacher or, you know, was that something that the student is just constantly struggling with? So it's been very beneficial to have that where we can say, okay, how can we modify, you know, this work that we're going to give? Um, you know, is it modified grading or do we need to reword the questions? Do we need to translate it into Spanish? Um, you know, whatever the case may be. And that's a lot of that communication element in co-teaching. It's definitely more work on the front side of things. Um, it's hard, I mean, we're not perfect. There have been days where we're like, what are we gonna do today? But for the most part, we're having to really communicate what do we wanna teach, how are we gonna teach it? Because um, there's no real wing in it when it's two people trying to form a cohesive unit. Now you can't come in and say, you know, I didn't do my lesson plan today. What, do you, what would you like to do today? We have to be really prepared, you know, and we have to look and sit down we're getting ready to go into Julius Caesar, and so we've prompted them with Shakespeare and introductions, and you'll see one of the introduction warm-ups that we did, um, but you know that's something that we sat down and said, okay, here's the unit we were talking today. Um, here's an anticipation guide. You know, where do you want to go from there? Um, let's look through this unit and take a look at this, or do we want to design, you know, something else to add to this? that type of thing. Um, we talked a little bit about sharing instruction, um, managing the class together. Um, we sat down and talked about, you know, how do we handle discipline? And so, you know, she talks about it being kind of like a marriage, you know, it is kind of like a work marriage because, I'll, you know, we sat down and said, you know, well, what if this happens, how would you handle that? Mm -hmm. And she'd say, well, what would you do? And so, you know, we would say, okay, well, when this happens, or if something does happen, we kind of look at each other. And, you know, it's almost like we know who's gonna take the lead. And, and it really depends too on like what that student needs. So much of teaching effectively is knowing your students as individuals. And when you have twice as many adults in the room who can learn them, then that's twice as many effective strategies. And we definitely have some kids that respond better to like, Okay, honey, let's take a breath. And then we have some kids that need to, you know, you have to be a little more heavy-handed with them and a little Buckle more Buckle down, let's go, enough playing around. And know? we're combined. We got all of those, like, approaches covered. So it really is just like, okay, you want to handle this one? Okay, no, I got it. Um, and, I, I mean, our kids have really taken to that and benefited They've from it. They've responded well. We, that class is one of the most well-behaved classes that I have experienced. And I've taught for two years as just... Um, a separate curriculum assistance lab, so I know what it's like to teach by yourself. And as far as classroom management and organization and student behavior, it has been a dream having another adult in the room to kind of help take some of that load off. Oh, definitely. Um, we talked about collaboration, um, participate in assessment of students. So we look at the tests, we decide, you know, how are we going to handle this testing, and that works out wonderfully because she does have a separate classroom and so you know if we have separate testing like currently we have about right at 12 students that leave out and so there's about half the class left so sometimes she'll take them sometimes I'll take them and we'll randomly pick some other kids also and just say you know we're going to split the class up for the test you know, when I come by and tap your shoulder, you're gonna come with me. Um, and so nobody like really stands out. People are not able to tell, oh, that child has an IEP. You know, that's why they're leaving. Because we pick regular kids too, you know, to come out with us. 
And in my, um, I also co-teach a Foundations of Math 1 course, and in that class we had 24 students, so we'll just go around and number like one, two, one, two, all the two stay here, all the ones come with me. So the kids, it really helps them buy into the idea that, oh, this isn't this special ed teacher in the classroom. Um, and it's, it's interesting the group that we get doing that oh, too. Oh yeah, we've got the desks numbered also. So all the desks are numbered. Um, we have right at 30 in our class, and which we're really blessed to have that. So um, some of the color coding with the numbers, some are pink, some are blue, some are orange, and we can say, everybody that's orange, stand up. You know, you're going with Miss Vance today, or you're going with Miss Bowden, or odd numbers. Um, and so we can, according to the numbers and the colors on their desk, we can use those to our advantage also, too. Um, she was talking about uh, co-teaching with uh, math. She does math also. Um, when we first started this, um, they said, we're going to pick some co-teachers. And initially I thought, oh, I don't want to be a person that's picked. Um, because I had had a bad co-teaching experience before, and the teacher never showed up. Um, we would, you know, get together to plan, and she would say, just put something together and let me know what I'm teaching and then she wouldn't show up for it. So then here I prepared this lesson for myself and she was supposed to go over this other. So then I would have to kind of like jump in and try to do it on my own. Um, or she'd take that time to go make copies for kids in her class. And so um, when I talked to them, I said, you know, don't put my name in the hat for that. You know, give that to somebody else. And sure enough, my name was, you know, the one that they had selected and so I was a little leery going into it and very, you know, worried. Um, but Stacy and, and Katie and them, they were really wonderful. They gave us a really great class on, you know, what does co-teaching, good co-teaching look like. And when they placed us together, um, I knew immediately it was going to be a great mesh of personalities. Um, so I wasn't really concerned about it this time around. And it's been a very great benefit to me. Oh, me too. I think the next slide is that, getting into the different co-teaching strategies. Oops, I think I pressed the wrong one. That is. Oh, yeah, and that's, there we go. But we've been saying, like, it's really just, we are going to work together as professionals to benefit our students. Um, it helps that we have a really good friendship as well. I think that is sort of um, an underlying current in our teaching style is that our kids can tell we get along. But even if you're not BFFs with your co-teacher, like, you have to fake it till you make right. it. The kids can't sense that tension there. Um, so it's about developing that professional relationship and that respect for each other as educators, even if you have completely different styles. And we didn't know a lot about each other when we first started teaching. We were just acquaintances, so we didn't hang out together and, you know, we're best friends or anything like that. But we sat down and talked about, you know, what are some commonalities, what are some things, you know, what do you like to do in your spare time? So we really took time to get to know each other. So I think that's really helped us, you know, get together and, and just learn from each other too. So especially for any of our principals here that are considering incorporating co-teaching into your schools, um, there's definitely some work that needs to go into selecting which teachers you're gonna partner together. But at the end of the day, as so long as there are agreeable humans that are there for the benefit of their students, they'll find a way to make it work. Yeah, definitely. These are some different types of co-teaching. So there's six co-teaching um, strategies that can be used. And so we sat down and we looked at the, the six and we said, in our class um, that Stacy and Katie had given us, they said, these are the ones you really want to avoid. And so um, the one teach, one observe, or the one teach, one assist, you do really want to avoid those because it's not going to do any good for me to be the regular ed teacher and stand up there. Ms. Bowden just goes around, you know, well, do you need help with this? Well, what do you need? Um, because then that's going to establish that I'm the person that's in charge and Ms. Bowden is basically acting like a teaching assistant. Um, and, you know, it wouldn't do any good for her to do that because then I'm kind of like, and we feel like it causes that other teacher to lose power, especially if discipline was to come into play. And so, you know, then when you have to discipline, 
or manage your class, they're going to say, well, you're not my regular teacher. I'm going to talk to so-and-so. Um, so when doing, go ahead. I was going to say it's like if you have children, you know, one parent's the good parent, one parent's the mean parent, and <laughs> you don't want to get on the mean parent's side. You go, you go right over to mom, give her a hug and hide from dad because dad's going to yell at you, but mom will give you a hug. And we don't want that. <laughs> And I think a lot of times... Sometimes they can't tell, you know, they're like, you know, which one is going to be the, oh, honey, it's uh, okay. Which one will be today? less mad if I do this? <laughs> but the one teach, one observe, and I think especially the one teach, one assist models, they do have their place in a co-teaching classroom, but I think when people initially picture co-teaching, that's what they think of, just the regular, edu regular education teacher in charge and then the special ed teacher serving as a glorified TA. Um, and while, I mean, there, there's definitely days where, you know, one of us takes a more assistant role, especially if we're not feeling well, but 99% of the time, we're at their team teaching, which we'll talk about what that kind of looks like right. later. Um, so, kind of, if you had any notions about co-teaching being like one teach, one observe, or one teach, one assist, mm -hmm. go ahead and dispel those, because that's not what effective co-teaching looks like. Um, we've got, uh, there's station teaching, parallel teaching, alternative um, in team teaching. We, um, the station teaching we talked about, you know, that would work really good in an elementary school setting. Now you can do stations in high school. Um, you have to be a little innovative about it, depending on how big your classroom is. Um, you can set up things on the wall and label it station one, um, and then put the kids in a group, and then they move as a group together into those stations. So each teacher can monitor you know, one side or one group, or we can rotate with that. Um, we've already put through the station teaching, so we can start yeah. with the definition. So um, we'll go through some of these. So we talked about the one observe um, and the one assist. Go ahead. Um, so they divide the instructional content into parts. Um, now sometimes you'll see desks facing one direction and desk facing another direction and that teacher may be teaching this group of kids over here and you know the other teacher is teaching this group over here but you would have to have a pretty large classroom to do that um, or if you have like a back table and you're only doing like four or five students you could do something like that. We've done kind of similar things with that pulling um, especially some of our kids that have difficulty with fluency and with um, written expression I've sat with them in the back before and kind of helped them catch up while the spans continues on, but that's not necessarily what station teaching is. It lends itself really, really well to an elementary setting where kids are kind of used to learning in stations anyway, and so having an instructor that can be at that station with them is right. really beneficial for our little ones. Right. Um, alternative teaching. So two different approaches to teaching the same information, learning. Um, the outcome is the same for all students, however the avenue for getting there is different. Um, I do this a lot in my yeah. math class. Um, because math, like it, so many different strategies for learning the same content, and it's especially important for kids to be able to access the strategy that's going to work best for them. So there will be times in our math class where my co-teacher, Mr. Bench, will stand up and deliver sort of like your typical math instruction, not that it's anything wrong with it, but just using the numbers and the symbols and the equations. Um, and then I'll go and reteach the same thing that I'm maybe using like manipulatives or symbols rather than um, that more abstract representation of numbers. And so that's been really beneficial for some of our kids, because some of our kids, they don't want to play with blocks. It makes them feel like, you know, kindergartners. Uh, but some of our kids, they need those blocks to get it. So alternative teaching works really, really well in a math class. I'm assuming it also worked really well in a science class or any class where you're dealing with multiple concepts and um, hands-on strategies for delivering that instruction. And I think that's the biggest thing, too, is depending on where you're looking at putting co-teachers is thinking about what type of strategy they're going to use because some strategies like she said are going to work better in a math and science class some are going to work better in a humanities or an english class um, so those are some things to really consider Go ahead. Um, i think we might have skipped over the um the video oh, i didn't can i go back yeah there we go so we teach in a style called team teaching and that's similar to what we've been saying. There's um, both teachers are responsible for delivering instruction. It's relatively seamless, especially on our good days. 
and the students can't really differentiate like right okay whose turn is it now okay like okay we're learning the warm-up with Miss Bad and no we're both out there at the same time delivering right. instruction kind of like you know talking to you today we kind of bounce off of each other we kind of go back and forth um, there's days we sound like we're a comedy team um, <laughs> you know it just depends um, this video right here um, is part of Shakespeare introduction to the students and so we thought about what's something fun that we can do we really want to get them energized and that's the whole thing is when you first say Shakespeare a lot of children go oh no you know <laughs> not just the easy kids like the regular red kids right. too like, you know and sometimes <laughs> teachers do so <laughs> it's a general groan in the classroom right. And it's because they don't understand it and, and it's not delivered in a way that they would understand. So, you know, as a teacher, you have to bring that energy, you know, and that's what we did is we said, well, this is a fun activity. So this activity is called Shakespearean insults. Um, and so what we did is we took Shakespeare insults and they had to create their own. This will kind of take you through our video. Um, starting off with their journal. Um, they, have, they start their journal every single day, then we discuss it. And then afterwards, you'll kind of see how we introduce an activity and then deliver it. And after all of this, we did go into more of a lecture style, um, Shakespeare's biography and interesting facts, but that video would have been 30 minutes long if we showed you the right. whole thing. So we're gonna- like, <laughs> They did a web the, quest <laughs> that they had to go through stick also. to the fun teenagers insulting each other using Elizabethan <laughs> speech patterns.
conversation where it gets in my brain. That plastic will be never used. <laughs> <laughs>
students that were featured or standing up at the front of the class were EC students. Um, we obviously had a mix of parts that we cut where we had our general ed kids up there as well, but I think this really just demonstrates how comfortable our EC kids are in a classroom where they feel supported and they feel like they can show mastery. Um, I've taught some of those kids before in different settings. Some of them have come up and talked to me before, like I'm petrified of this other English class I'm in, but in our class, because they feel supported, they're confident enough to stand up in front of their peers and read off Shakespearean insults, and which is like super big for a teenager whose ego is so small and fragile and precious that we were super proud of all of them. We have really seen a lot of them really expand and just come out of their shell. Um, and I think we work really hard to make it a safe environment. Um, we One thing that we established at the very beginning is there's a lot of things that are going to get you in trouble, but one thing in particular is making fun of somebody. And so, you know, we tell them, you speak out, you raise your hand, um, you know, we're not going to tolerate you making fun of somebody, or, you know, there's, as they say, there's no dumb question. Um, and we haven't had any trouble at all. And I think it's because of the environment that we established from the beginning of the year. And it makes a lot of these children that were very scared to talk in class, to do an activity like this, they feel like they're in a safe environment where they can raise their hand. And a lot of times our EC students participate a lot more than some of our regular ed students. Because you're doing an assignment today where they had to translate some Shakespearean quotes and we had the same three students that, I think two of whom had IEPs that just kept answering over and over again. We're like, guys, can someone else try? And there's just, this program, this system, really benefits our students more than anything else. Um, those are a few points we have listed on our presentation here, but like, just looking at it, fewer classroom disruptions. Um, one of the biggest fears that teachers had as far as classroom management goes, what if a student is being disruptive and I need to take them out? Well, we have two teachers, so one can stay and continue teaching, the other teacher can pull that student out and have a conversation with them. Or if a student is struggling and falling behind, now there's that second person who is equally as dedicated to the student to work with them independently while the rest of the class continues. And it's, it's hard enough to have, you know, some teachers have 40 kids in a class and we're very blessed to only have 30. And that's a lot for one teacher. And to try to get to every student that has an IEP, to get to everyone um, and service them the way that we need to, it's such a benefit to be part of a co-teaching team because we can alternate, pull some to a table, we can sit down with them, help them. Um, you know, there's two of us, so basically we have 15 students apiece. And I mean, that's a teacher's dream. It really is. We never lose any instruction time to deal with classroom management. You saw how quickly they were able to like pass up their journals and I could pass out tickets as a reward while this dance was continuing on. Um, those are duties that we switch off, taken care of. and. I mean, at the end of the day, if something's going to benefit an EC student's learning, it's also going to benefit a Gen Ed student's learning. Um, there's a real difficulty as someone who writes IEPs seeing students that don't qualify for services but that still need help. And so it's been a huge honor to be able to still help those kids and address their needs and give them services even if they don't have a 20-sheet document saying that we have to do it. And this also, um, I was going to say there was um, one slide in here where we talked about the benefits of a teacher, of being a teacher in a co-teaching classroom. It's, you always have someone you can depend on. Um, it's been really great on days when 
one of us is absent because we know that our kids are still receiving instruction and not just, you know, busy work with the sub. Um, not that we don't appreciate our subs, subs are wonderful, I was a sub, <laughs> but it's different. You know, your kids don't learn as much if they have a substitute. So no matter what, our third period kids know that there's gonna be a teacher in that room that's gonna keep them in line and give them things to learn. Yeah. And it's been a huge um, relief for us you know, if you're having kind of an off day, you know you've got a partner in the room that can help pick up the slack for you. Um, we can divvy up some of the duties and responsibilities of teaching. It's just, it's. I wish I could do this all day every day because it's really been a blast. And seeing the benefits in our students have really just made this whole process worth it. I agree. Did any of you have any questions? <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> Right, we have, um, well, she is in the math class until about 10, 10, um, and so then she comes over to my class. That's the only disadvantage that we have is we don't, she doesn't really have necessarily a planning period, um, so she's kind of leaving out of the other class a little bit to come and have planning with me during the second uh, period, and so we sit down together and look at the agenda for that week um, or however many weeks that we're going to plan together. Um, sometimes after school we'll spend some time together, um, but we do a lot outside of school too. We email each other or we talk on the phone together and say, hey, you know, I know we talked about doing this, but what do you think if we add this to it? And so there's times on the weekend where we call each other and, you know, say, you know, I was thinking about this and how about adding this on to it. So we do some of our own time also, not just during school. Anybody else have any questions? Be brave is what I tell my students to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for taking the time to come listen to us. Um, this is a really, really fantastic model, not only for our EC kids, but for our Gen Ed students who may be struggling and don't have an IEP. Um, and I think every child could benefit from having teachers, extra teachers in the classroom. Definitely, and we feel privileged to be a part of this. And you know, we just want to thank everybody for the opportunity, you know, to have this in our school and be able to do something like this. Because ultimately, it's about the children, and so that's what we're here for. Um, or we wouldn't be here. Okay. <laughs>